South Africans are getting almost spoiled for choice now with new products that uh, have been available elsewhere in the world, not available here, coming into the country. A couple of months ago, there was a very big development which allowed actively managed exchange traded funds to be listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. We're going to find out about one of those from uh, a, the duo at 10x Investments. They're running it through their core shares acquisition. I remember talking about that a little while ago. You found that interview on Biz News TV as well. Today, we're going to talk to Michelle North and Chris Eddy. Michelle looks after distribution for financial intermediaries at 10X Investments. Chris is the co-manager of the fund under question, and he's also the head of multi-asset funds. Thanks, guys, for um, taking us through this. It is something that having researched ahead of this interview, I wasn't 100% aware of. But it looks like actively managed exchange-traded funds are now a proper competitor for unit trusts. Or am I, um, Michelle, am I actually getting the cat by the braces, as a, a good friend of mine used to put it? That's a great place to start, Alec. You're absolutely right. So, you know, in unit trust format, you can have index strategies and actively managed strategies. And now we we have the same possible, you know, in the listed exchange traded fund format, it's possible to have a pure index tracking product listed as an ETF or something that doesn't strictly track an index listed as an AM ETF. Actively managed AM ETF. Well, John Bogle, when he started the whole exchange traded fund story, it was really at, at Vanguard. It was, let's find something that can track the S&P 500 index without you having to buy all the shares in the 500 index in their weightings. And it, it took a while to catch on, but it really has caught on uh, hugely now elsewhere in the world. But this, this move to actively manage the exchange traded fund itself is, is quite a, a significant development, I guess, also for South Africa. Chris, why is it, maybe you can tell us what it will bring into the universe now. Yeah, so there are multiple different use cases, all the way from sort of high concentration stock picking portfolios through to our use case, which is effectively building solutions to deliver kind outcomes. So I mean, I'm sure many of your 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 listeners will be aware of both the 10x and the core shares brand. Uh, we don't our our bread and butter isn't stock picking. That's not part of our investment philosophy. But before you were unable to include certain asset classes that couldn't be indexed, or multi asset strategies that don't necessarily track an index in an ETF, and that's really been our use case is to build a well diversified income solution and make that available. In the listed environment. So this is a new listing. It is a uh, AM actively managed ETF. So AM ETF, like an income fund. And how does it differ from the income fund that you've already got? Uh, it, it's effectively a mirror. The major difference is how how clients would access that. The unit trust you can access either on a Lisp environment or directly through a 10x platform. Whereas the AM ETF is exactly the same strategy, it just trades on the JAC and, and can be bought and sold like any other share on the exchange, held in a custody account or a stock, stock broking portfolio. So it's really, it's really the wrapper rather than the strategy. The strategy is exactly the same, the wrapper is different, and how clients access that would be through different channels. Often I've thought about buying an ETF through a stock broking account, but have been put off by the high brokerage fees, or at least maybe it's just in my head. Uh, how does that, um, how is it possible now that you can buy something which is already carries a fee, an exchange-rated fund, but then you've also got to pay commission to the stockbroker? Uh, is it because we now have low-cost stockbrokers that it becomes viable, Michelle? So, Alec, you know, that's a really good point. And I think people who've always had their investments through unit trusts struggle with exactly that understanding sort of the exchange-traded nature and all the fees. Um, when when you invest in a unit trust, the fund manager goes and buys the underlyings and pays brokerage actually to buy those and you know accumulate them into the unit trust to fulfill you know your investment and put it to work. And so actually you are paying those commissions, but they just 
being sort of averaged in the fund. So when other people are buying and selling or investing and disinvesting from a unit trust, the whole fund is sharing in those costs. Whereas when you're buying and selling ETFs, those costs are explicit. So you know exactly what commission you pay and what the bid offer spread is when you trade. So you have more transparency and control over that. And then so what we actually tend to see is that over the long term, if you have two similar product, you know, the same strategy in an ETF and in a unit trust, the TIC on the unit trust will be higher than on the ETF because all of those trading costs of the investors trading in and out are bought, you know, aggregated across all the fund holders. So it really is just a slightly different sort of operating model, but bringing you out at a very similar result. So it's easy enough or it's, it is cost effective to use an easy equities account or a Standard Bank Online share trading account, say, to buy um, an actively managed ETF? Absolutely. Um, ETFs and AM ETFs trade and settle like a share. So they can be held in you know, online share trading accounts or accessed via traditional stockbrokers. And it's very neat for people who are building share portfolios, who want to build more of a you know, globally diversified portfolio to blend in some ETFs, whether that is to access their sort of uh, global equities portion or a, a, a block of sort of pr property exposure or, you know, in this case now, there's a diversified total income solution available too that's got, you know, off, um, an offshore exposure and corporate credit, government bonds, money market, all sort of mixed together already in this one one simple product. I'm glad to hear that because right from the outset, 10X and core shares, in fact, have both been very low cost offering or the offerings have been low cost. It's been almost part of your whole strategy. But maybe we can delve a little deeper, Chris. You are the uh, co-manager of this fund. Uh, w the assets that Michelle explained just a moment ago, uh, can you give us a breakdown of how much you sure. have in South African bonds and how much in Eskom bonds, by the way? Because I think a lot of people <laughs> want to know whether you've got an exposure there. We have good news on that. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> this, uh, we, we don't have exposure to any SOEs in the portfolio. But really... Along with sort of the the low cost aspect, which has been a core sort of investment philosophy for the 10x business, diversification has also always been a key uh, pillar of our investment philosophy. So when it comes to this income solution, it's strategically diversified across a wide range of fixed and floating rate instruments. There's a, a, about a 30 to 35% exposure to South African government bonds, it's about a 15% exposure to inflation linked bonds. Um, about a, uh, through the cycle, we potentially see about a twenty percent exposure to South African credit, um, but but in that pop, in that box, not really S any SOEs, and then quite interestingly, a twenty percent exposure to global credit, both investment grade and high yield, uh, and then and then about a ten percent allocation to liquidity. So I think one of the interesting um, roles that this product can play. In personal share portfolios or in, in stockbroking accounts, is really the role of access. Because if you think about current other current fixed income ETFs in the market, you've got kind of broad gubbies or broad inflation linked bonds, um, and and or maybe a broad global bond index. But to give you an idea, to get access to things like NCDs, you have to trade them in a a, a twenty million rand lot, which is kind of out of reach for most individuals. But through the structure and kind of pooling the assets all together, we're able to provide access to these asset classes, which would traditionally be out of reach for sort of individual share portfolios like global high yield, global investment grade, kind of different parts of the SA cash curve. So over, over, and, over and above sort of the strategically diversified nature of the strategy, it's also providing access to certain asset classes that one typically wouldn't be able to get access to through a, a share account or a stockbroking portfolio. Democratizing investments in another way. I was talking to guys recently who are democratizing investments in property. You can buy a, an apartment or a share of an apartment for a rand. And this is democratizing investments again in, a, in an area which previously was only for institutions. And the yield um, looks very juicy. Just explain yeah. how you can make like 9% because that was on, on your yeah, latest Alex, fact I mean, sheet. It's really, it's potentially a quite a fortuitous time to be bringing this product to market given how high yields are 
not only locally in a South African context, but also globally after a, a decade or more of interest rates being held at zero, you now from just pure US dollar T-bills, you're getting five and a half percent, which is really attractive compared to where we've been over the last decade. From a South African perspective, the way we like to think about it is from holding a South African inflation linked bond, you can get a real yield of about four and a half percent, which means that it's a really high starting hurdle against which lots of other asset classes actually potentially compete against. Because if you think about it, if inflation's seven, you're getting seven plus four and a half. That's a really attractive return. Um, I mean, just to contextualize that, SA equities over the last de decade delivered about inflation plus four and a half. So the return opportunity based on the high yields, both in the SA market as well as globally offshore, really uh, provide an opportune time for investors to start thinking about fixed income, income, bonds as a, as a real return source for in, in their asset allocation. And uh, there's a really uh, great investment opportunity based off where yields currently are. So to get back to your question in terms of, um, in terms of the portfolio, so the, the, the latest yield as, as at today is actually, uh, it's actually increased up to about 9.9%. Um, and that is uh, to think about it in sort of a risk spectrum, the maximum duration or interest rate risk in the portfolio is capped out at three years. To give some sort of context, a broad government bond index has about a duration of about six years. Um, and as a result, what we're trying to do with this product and, and a good way for clients to think about it is deliver bond-like returns, but with a lot less risk. Uh -huh. Okay. So the, 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 the volatility would be lower then, but the returns would be the same. So, Michelle, who's, who's this going to appeal to? Well, I mean, you, you sort of termed ETF investing as democratizing investing. So I think that's really the, the beauty of these products is how flexible they are and how appropriate and easy to access for all types of investors. So we do have a lot of um, wealth managers that run share portfolios who are using this product already. Um, and, you know, it's a very convenient way for them to access fixed income along with all the other, you know, individual shares and ETFs that they are, are trading. Um, then, it, it, you know, self-directed investors as well through platform, you know, the online share trading platforms, some of the examples you mentioned. Um, we've had investors calling in who are interested because of the yield profile and, you know, the, the sort of controlled volatility, as Chris mentioned. So, you know, you're going to get a nice steady yield with a quite a, a smooth ride. So that appeals to a lot of investors, um, potentially older investors as well who check the, you know, check check on the investments every day and don't want to see, you know, big moves in the in the capital portion. So, you know, this product on the back testing, the max drawdown over kind of the worst crisis, which I think was the COVID crisis in what we tested, was 4%. Um, whereas, uh, you know, government bonds was down around 9.8% over that time. So, you know, much less risk, a much smoother ride and this attractive, nice, steady yield. And that's because of the, fact, the, the way that it's been structured as this kind of risk-controlled solution targeting CPI plus two and a half percent. So it's designed to give you inflation plus two and a half percent over three year rolling periods. So you're using the American term drawdown, in other words, loss. So the, the worst loss it was at 4%. And, and that was kind of a, a, another follow-up question for you, Chris. We do know that bonds, when interest rates are volatile, when interest rates fall, then bonds improve in their capital value. When interest rates rise, then bonds actually reduce in their capital value, hence the drawdown that you spoke about, the 4% loss during the pandemic. By having such a short term, such a short period, are you avoiding that? Are you avoiding the, the, the capital, ex or capital loss or gain exposure? And as a result of that, is that where your lower volatility comes from? So it really comes through, through two, two ways. The one is the limit on total interest rate risk in the portfolio. So what that means is, uh, like you were saying, if yields increase, bond prices typically decrease. And the extent to which they decrease depends on, on how long the term or the duration of those bonds are. So with government bonds at kind of a six-year duration and the max duration on this product at, at three years, that's the one risk control. 
But like you rightly say, that lowering of duration uh, impacts the upside and the downside capital nature. But over and above this, the strategy isn't just invested in government bonds. It's got global credit. It's got some offshore currency exposure in the portfolio as well. So when you're introducing those different asset class exposures, you're further diversifying away that specific SA government bond risk, which, which actually brings uh, sort of the, the, the diversification and sort of the, the, risk, the risk drawdowns. Uh, it, it helps to limit that, not only in terms of the duration, but also the mix of assets in the portfolio. So you would then, being actively managed, be looking at the whole credit market on an ongoing basis to make sure that you don't get caught up with, well, I was going to say a Steinhoff, but even with Steinhoff, their, their pref shares uh, still continued to, to deliver a return. So w- what's your risk here? Where's the exposure? Huh? What can go wrong? That's, that's a great question, Alex, because it really, I think, ties in how we think about investing from a philosophical perspective. We aren't stock pickers. So what we're not doing is we're not going and working through the financial statements of one specific issuer and saying, we think that the risk of default is mispriced on the security, so we're going to invest in it. The way we look to manage credit risk is really through diversification and then the spread at which we buy that credit. A great example of that is, is how we built our exposure to global credit. Through the cycle, we're looking to have about a 20% exposure to global credit. And the way we built that is we built a basket of 425 different issuers. Actually, like a lot of the names that I think equity investors will be familiar with, the likes of Apple, AT&T, these shares that you'll find in your global equity portfolio, why shouldn't you hold them in your global, global fixed income portfolio? So by holding such a broad, well-diversified basket of issuers, what that means with, with 425 issuers and held at an equal weight, which is also quite an important consideration when you're thinking about building credit, because you don't necessarily want exposure to those companies that issue the most debt and are the most over-indebted. What that practically means is that a 20% exposure of global credit in the portfolio, you've got less than a, f- a five basis point, so 0.05% exposure to any one single issuer. And that's how we seek to manage um, manage that credit risk. So even if one or two of those companies actually default, the impact at a portfolio level won't be won't be felt at all. And then the second aspect is really that yield that we can buy that credit at. And and this is also quite interesting. The local credit market is extremely tight because there's this very limited supply and there's lots of money that's looking to invest in the local credit market. And what that's meant is that spreads are really tight. So for your local credit market, which ultimately cannot have a higher rating than the sovereign. And we know South Africa is sub-investment grade. So on a global basis, all local issuers are actually sub-investment grade as well. The spread that you're earning on local credit is about 120 basis points, so 1.2% above government. On a global basis, for a similar sort of high yield rated basket, you're earning almost four times the amount of spread above government yield, so about 450 basis points. So through both the lens of diversification and sort of what you're being paid from a spread perspective, we think that obviously global credit is quite an attractive asset class to include, but it also gives you a sense in terms of how we think about managing the risk and the exposure around that, which is very much true to sort of the indexation nature of our roots. Michelle? I think that's a really great point to just make really clear. So even though this is an actively managed ETF, the, the individual asset allocations, for example, to credit is through a rules-based methodology. So the the bit that's sort of active is more the asset allocation decision. Um, and and for that, we needed to wait for this uh, AM ETF regulation to be passed by the JSE in order to list the solution. So it is passed. It's now listed. It's an actively managed ETF giving you exposure to credit. I was looking at the April figure, which uh, had the yield at 9.2%. It's done even better now, 9.9%. The return inflation plus 2.5%. So it's pretty clear the people who would be uh, attracted to this product, perhaps from time to time when you've got a bit of liquidity and you're a bit worried about equity markets and that's where you have the mo- most of your investments, then 
this is a, a good buffer, which is very high yielding. Michelle Noth is head of distribution for financial intermediaries at 10X Investments. And Chris Eddy is the head of 10X's multi-asset funds. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 